Chaz Kang is here for Speak Minneapolis, and my special guest at this time is going to be coming to First Avenue on July 24th with the Midnight Revival supporting his new album, Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Killer Mike. Killer Mike, how are you doing today? I'm very happy to be here. I'm doing very well, man. Good to be here. Wonderful. Well, first things first, congrats on the phenomenal new album. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, put a put a put a few years into making it. So it's very, very good to see it received so well and that it, it moves people. Uh-huh. Yep. And uh, the the tour you're coming is the High and Holy Tour, which is takes yes. us from a song from the album itself. So that in mind, when it comes to your songwriting approach, when you were working on the album, how much of that did you have the live show in mind? Well, I mean, I knew by way of the sound the album we were making. Live show is, as a musician, one of your favorite things, one of my favorite things. The Run the Jewels, uh, for instance, I love the fact that I get to live out like wannabe Run DMC fantasies of a nine-year-old kid because it's two MCs and a DJ, and it's uh, it's awesome lighting and our and our you know our, our logo up there in huge hands. So this this record though, I um, while making it, I I envisioned a a rich musical experience that's much like Southern revival culture where you'll go to these small churches, Pentecostal churches, and they'd be these traveling churches and traveling preachers and traveling bands that come through. So your grandmother will have you out on a Wednesday or Thursday night and people are dressed in plain clothes. You'd have to get up dressed up. And it was almost like watching a play. You got to hear uh, these amazing musicians. The preacher would get preach a fiery sermon on how the sweaty people get motivated and uh, I wanted to give people experience, something like that. So we're going to see how close I get. Mm-hmm. Nice. So is that where the the Midnight Revival comes from then? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's when the sinners and the saints, you know, when you you can, you can catch all the sinners coming out of the juke joint and all the saints coming out of the revival. And Pentecostal church go long. So you might get there at 8. You might not leave at 1145. So you might end up, you might end up at the same Christmas. You know what I mean? So we're going to be having uh, live musicians with you for this as part of the revival, or is it going to be more than not live old, musicians old, this old. time, but the choir. We're bringing the choir. Yeah, we're, we're bringing them in our revival. Um, you know, I I want to I want to I want to get it to the point we do the whole church, and we're going to get to that point. Right now, we're bringing out the choir, the DJ, uh, and, and and the me. Uh, I, I, I'm coming through like a Pentecostal MC. <laughs> you know, spectacular. So uh, when putting together like the set list for a show like this, is it very different than putting together for uh, the Run the Jewels shows? Yeah, it's different. It's different. It's different in that. Um, it's different that in this set list, uh, you're, you're, you're again with the Run the Jewels. We're, we're putting on a, a badass traditional, you know, um, rap show on steroids. That's the that's the goal of the Run the Jewels show. And to add, you know, other elements in terms of how we've been influenced through rock lighting, stuff like that. But this show is meant to feel more in, in, um, intimate. It's meant to give you um, an experience that is, that, that is revival-like. So, yeah, it, it's not the same experience. I, I don't want to give you Run the Jewels light. That wouldn't be fair to the audience. I want to give you something new and, 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 that, and that you walk away with, um, with a, a different feeling, but, but a, an, an amazing feeling just... Like you get an amazing feeling at a Run the Jewel show, but but slightly different. So does that mean we could potentially be hearing a bit further back into the the Mike catalog? Maybe God in the Building. Maybe you'll be doing the whole world verse over the Stevie Wonder high. Who friend. knows, man? Same. I don't know Ric Flair. I don't know Kristen. Mm-hmm. Who knows any of those? I think there's going to be some nostalgia in there. Though. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Ric Flair, I don't know if you can see. I have a signed Ric Flair. Sure. I already see. It. I, got, I, I got. I got to get a signed shirt. I got the signed belt. I got the ten pounds of gold, and I got um. I got some signed pics. So shout out to shout out to Aunt. Man. I see Rick in the Air Force in first class, and it's always love when I see him. Nice. And uh, and you recently tweeted uh, on Twitter that the Dusty Rhodes Hard Times promo was a recent <laughs> inspiration for you. Oh man, come on, man. I, I'm talking about. I might listen to it when we get out there. Man, that Hard Times promo, man, oh. unbeatable, man. Got to get you through some days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, with the history of uh, wrestling in Atlanta in particular and you being yeah. such a, you know, a proud son of Atlanta, uh, how important has a, uh, Atlanta wrestling culture been to uh, oh, you? Man. As well as- Wildfire, Rich, Terry, Funk, Tony, Atlas. Oh, man. Oh, just Junkyard, Dog, man, Dusty, Rick. 
Rick always says his greatest rivalry is Ricky Steamboat, and I, I feel him, you know. But just from the fans, Rick, it was you and Big Dust, man. Mm -hmm. You guys represented Wall Street to blue collar, and you guys were the antithesis of each other in the eighties. And you, the you and the Four Horsemen was the team everybody wanted to be on, and Dusty was the was the underdog everybody wanted to be. So, you know, it it, it meant a lot to me. Wrestling, wrestling meant a lot to me, you know. The Von Erics out of Texas, man. Jerry King Lawler and Mitch South Wrestling up in Tennessee. Like it's just, man. It just, I believe that 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 boys, um, they need adventure, they need play, they need these, their imagination takes them towards saving and heroes and heels and villains. And wrestling has been a big part of that in American culture. And at the time, um, I was a kid, it was really growing and figuring out what it was past being just kind of these blood baths. <laughs> and um it was it's I just I appreciate the wrestling culture that came out of Turner Broadcasting. Shouts out to OG Ted Turner, man. Mm -hmm. He knew what he was doing. Filling that time up on TV. He knew what he was doing. Yeah. yeah. Six or five PM on Saturdays, you know, still Yeah, yeah you already know that. <laughs> yep. On the Superstation. Yeah, on the Superstation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was this other channel, Channel 69 that would wrestling would start coming on at like nine at night, you know, eight or nine at night. And it played to five or six the next morning. They play, they play wrestling from all different regions, even as far as Japan. It was Joe Piscopo and Donna Shore or Donna Summers, Donna Sun, not Donna Summers, Donna Shore, I think was the lady's name, but Joe Piscopo um, was, was, was this large dude. He was, he was round as a bowling ball. But it was, it was pretty dope, man. Wrestling was big in Southern California. Spectacular. Yeah. And First Avenue you're going to be performing is actually where uh, our top promotion out here in Minnesota, First Wrestling, is also based out of. So, wow. Yeah. So, I'm sure the echoes in the walls being felt there. So, yes, sir. Yeah. So, um, uh, on this on the new album, Michael, uh, you know, you mentioned how for listeners, for some, it's going to be uh, an immersive uh, voyeuristic experience. And yeah. for other listeners, it's uh, very much so a, a snapshot documentation, uh, for lack of better words. And um, one thing I really enjoyed on the album uh, is uh, continued, whether you want to refer to it as, you know, uh, giving artists their flowers or just shouting outs, the mentioning of different yeah. names, different artists. And that carries in such a hip hop tradition of, you know, mentioning the names of people, you know, or people who influenced you as yeah. part of the documentation. So that in mind, I'm curious, do you have a favorite time another artist has referenced to you by name in a song? Man, the Denzel Curry reference for Run the Jewels was amazing with Killer Mike and LP line. The Kendrick shout out, of course, um, was 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 amazing because it made people perk up, pay attention. Um, anytime Big Boy gives me a shout out, I just man, I'm just like a little bro, just grinning because he's your fucking big bros, man. He's sold over ten million records. He's part of the greatest rap group ever, and for him to take the time to shout you out is just like shit. You know what I'm saying? Um, but those those would probably be the top three. Sweet. Um, so uh, when I covered uh, uh, R.A.P. music or rap music for Spectrum yeah. um, uh, back when that dropped, uh, I noticed how like the album itself finds found so much of the soundscape of it within the proud tradition of so many different genres within Atlanta music. And yeah. I, this new album in particular, so many different eras of Atlanta hip hop you can hear throughout the soundscape in different times and that constant change and evolution. And, you know, yeah. uh, also speaking to you, you know, with this year and it coming out, it's the 20th anniversary of Monster. Uh, it's the 15th anniversary of the leak of Ghetto Extraordinary, as well as the 15th anniversary <laughs> of the building. Um, so being you have such this decades-long catalog, do you have any particular favorite song of yours that you wish was more well-known amongst your fans? I, I wish more people, and I know they're going to hear it now, God in the Building 1 and 2. Hmm. You know, you know, no ID. Um, and, and Tech did, I think, God in the Building 1. Um, and it's just they did one or two. I'm a little stoned, but it it is a it is a come home moment for for me with this album, Michael. But the God in the Building records are are special records to me. Um, Niggas Down South is another one that I thought it was like phew, just one of those records that was a big record, you know. And and, and yeah, those 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 would be it. Those would be the three. Oh, uh, Rick Flair, Rick Flair, mm -hmm. at four. Um. And if we were going to round it out to five, 10 G's. 
go. Cool. That's 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 the deep cut playlist. So yeah. Cool. So uh this year's also the 20th anniversary of your guest verse on Bone Crusher's Never Scared. Yeah. And uh there's you know very memorable collaboration and there was so much collaboration happening in hip hop at that time. Just out of curiosity, uh do you have any collaboration that you were fond of, really proud of that maybe did not get released that we haven't had the chance to hear yet that due to label politics. There's or- one right now called Old Atlanta by Young Boot and Schooly, and it has me and T.I. And it really feels good because it sees, you know, Book is a, a new artist. Schooly is a is a young artist and a little more seasoned as he's been around a little longer. And me and T.I. are two crafty veterans and the record just feels great. It feels like, um, it feels like a city that's getting along, you know what I mean? And, and so I would advise people to, to check out that Young Boot record. Sweet. Cool. Um, you've also been someone who's been at the very forefront of technology. So looking at even something like Twitter, you know, before even Questlove was the the must follow in 2009, you were the the must follow uh, at that point. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so... I- well, I was, was going to say, my little sister Smiley just puts me on this stuff, man. She's so oh. like, yes, yeah, so, so, Smiley is. Smiley was, um, she's been, she's been since she was like a kid in high school. She's been helping, you know, me and Grind Time for those people who may not know my crew, Grind Time Rap Game. Bang, bang, um, bang. Yeah, bang, bang, bang. You already know. She's been helping me, like, bro, this is what you need to be doing. In fact, my first call of the morning was, hey, these two new things are out bro, you need to get on these. So I'm getting her and the digital team hooked up because she set up every account I've ever had. <laughs> so from MySpace, I think, from, yep, from MySpace to Facebook to Twitter, you know. So I don't I don't really, I liked Twitter at one time because it put you in direct contact with the audience. Then it turned to a bunch of people yelling at each other. It got weird. And I like, you know, Facebook, I came for chicks in bikinis. Like everybody came at first. And I was like, oh, they got toy cars and muscle cars and great books and stuff that I stayed on IG. I meant to say I just stayed on IG because I found so many interesting people. I found other artists. I found art. I found cool stuff. That's why the reason I stay there. But I operate best where I kind of deal directly with with the other audience. You know what I mean? So, you know, I don't, I don't know. I think that honestly, though, it's probably time to shut all this stuff out and just go back outside and meet each other. You know? Yeah. But yeah, man, you mentioned those those early, early days of Twitter. Like, I remember just randomly Scarfaces on Twitter at 3 a.m. just saying, is anyone up? And I took it as an yeah. hour. I just talked about, like, early Devin the Dude Odd Squad records for an hour. Yes, so, man, yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. Man. So, um, yeah, so uh, speaking of... Human uh, beings really will fuck up some cool shit, don't we? We, we do. We do. <laughs> we do. Among the worst species to do that, it's, you know, it's... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's us Dang. and Sawtooth Grain Beetles. We're at the bottom. Yeah. Two, so... Um, so another thing I want to talk about 2009 with you quick going way back, just because, uh, I don't think we've ever gotten like a real, uh, knowledge publicly about what sort of happened with this for a brief amount of time. You had changed your name to Mike Biga. Yeah. And so, um, just so to have it like on record, um, what led to that happening? And then what led to that, to the, the change back? I think, it, I mean, it sounds, it's a cool AKA. I still, my, for some reason, it's stuck with my wife because people still call her Shea Bigger. But, you know, man, you just, I, I had gotten to the point where you just feel like you're hitting your head against a wall and you're like, well, maybe it is the killer mic that's preventing me from, so let me try to think of something else that sounds cool. You know what I mean? And um, when Jason DeMarco gave me an opportunity to say, hey, man, we're making rap music. I'm going to find a budget. We're going to make it happen. He's like, I just want to ask you, man, can you just, just be killer Mike. And I, and that was one of the most cool things for a corporation to say, no, man, we're not like Columbia records. We, we actually love your name. So let's get it. You know, to have someone have my back like that just made me wear it proud, even more proud. You know, I was never ashamed of the name because I earned it in a rap battle as a kid, but you know, when you're in, when you're in the market and man, it gets to be crazy. You, you just try your best to give yourself a shot. So, you know, I, I gave it a try. The fans were like, nope, we like Killer Mike. You can AKA the Mike bigger, but we prefer Killer Mike. So here I am. It's what they'll put on my headstone one day, you know. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm glad to have that that story out in the open now. Because I know that that was such a weird time when certain, like, large department stores who retailed music would refuse to stock Ghostface Killer, but had no qualms about yeah, stock. Yeah, yeah. 
the killers. Listen, they would they would stop the killers, and then they would say, "Go save the killers, kill them white we can." Yeah, I wonder why that oh. was. But, yeah, uh, well, I, I wonder what that could be. <laughs> uh, Dope band, though. I fucked with the killers. But I was like, damn. I, I remember getting to Vegas one time and just looking at, like, they're, they had, it was like, I maybe right there for this huge thing. I'm just like, you know, those motherfuckers in Columbia told me you couldn't go with killers. It never worked. So mm-hmm. maybe because it was more of them. <laughs> so uh, um, two more questions. Uh, so one is, um, Speaking of, uh, you know, when you mentioned like you and technology, uh, we were able to play as you as in the fighting game Def Jam Icon. Uh, we've been able to play with your likeness in Gears of War a few years back as well. Uh, and especially since around like 2016 or so, we've heard Run the Jewels music licensed in not just so many video games, so many commercials, so many different forms of yeah. media and art. Uh, do you have either like a favorite moment or maybe a most unexpected moment where you've heard your own music pop up? The Madden 2004, when I redid the action, that was the Madden 2003 or four. Mike Vick was on the cover. That was proud. That just got, because I felt like that was not only a win for me, um, it was it was just pretty big time for my city. It made me feel like a total rock star. Excellent. Yeah, that was my favorite Madden, just because of like they would play the music when the ambulance would go like on the field to pick up the yeah. <laughs> so out of place in one hand, but it's like, yeah, someone yeah. got hurt. So yeah, as a kid, man, that's it. Like I remember, they'd be raising and rising in pain on it. You're just going crazy, like this is the best shit ever. I just ended someone's career <laughs> in Madden. Yeah, and play the celebratory party song because of that. Yeah, yeah, cool. So uh, finally, um, having followed your career for so long and part of the fun of it is the fact that you always have been someone who has followed your heart through everything and you've always been so much yourself, your perspective, your style, everything you've brought through on there. So, and, but that uh, also leads to that, you know, you've also really not put too much care into what other people have maybe have thought of you and and things you've said, but on the flip side, you're also someone who has been so precise with like such a definitive eye in the things that you say, the things that you've uh, presented that, you know, I'm sure at some point, I'm not to project, but maybe on some level when people get things about you so wrong, it's mildly hurts them at times. Yeah. So that in mind, um, floor is yours completely since I'm prompting it. What would you say is the biggest misconception either about you or your music that you would like to clear up? Um, If there is one, let me say, if there is one. I I think people believe I'm becoming a conservative or or whatever their idea of a a conservative is. I think what I am is a hybrid of my grandparents and their thinking. I I saw two amazingly determined people, a man born in 1922 in Eden, Georgia, and a woman born in 1932 in Tuskegee, Alabama. The woman's family sharecropped and eventually bought their own farm and had land and left legacy that's still in our family to this day. The the man's father abandoned him. He was forced to drop out of school in third grade, have to raise he and his two sisters and help his mother. And he grew up to become a homeowner, you know, used that home to rent, to add extra income, ran whiskey, you know. He was not terribly religious. She was very religious. He could be probably considered more of a libertarian-like thinker, minus the mild racism that the current party has. Sometimes he uh, he was he was he was uh, he was a government out of my business. Let me take care of my own business. Um whatever tax I have to pay, I pay and just and in the census, this is the two people here, this is our age, these are children. He was very limited. I mean my grandmother would have this classic argument where she was more involved in politics, SCLC member, NAACP, that type of stuff. She said, my grandfather would say, if God gave you the good sense to, to, if you have an appetite and God gave you the good sense to make a fishing pole, you shouldn't be regulated by government on where you can fish, how many fish you can catch, because you're solving the problem of hunger. And my grandmother was like, yep, but somebody got to clean up the park. So you pay your taxes, so the game warden can do that. And what I learned was nothing is absolute. And I think that people, what they think about me is somehow I'm an absolute uh, to whatever their reason for liking me is. And nothing is absolute. I'm from a group of people that have only been free 60-something years. And many of our allies 
have turned out to be not so good allies. And some of the unexpected allies we've had, we thought we had nothing in common with, yet here we are, you know. So, you know, I think that the biggest misconception people have about me is they think for whatever reason they choose to like me, that it that I am absolute. Some, you know, the caricature of what that's supposed to be, and that's just not true. Huh. I'm just a human being. And, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm, uh, you know, I care about things I care to research about things, but I care beyond if I don't get my way, I'm still going to care. You know, and I think that in society today, we're so consumed with getting our way that we forget even if we don't get our way, we're still a member of the community and we have a responsibility. Perfectly stated. Well, um, uh, the one way that I'm going into absolute is I'm absolutely excited for Monday, July 24th. <laughs> Killer Mike in the Midnight Revival at First Avenue. Michael, available in stores now. Killer Mike, thank you so much for this. This is phenomenal. I appreciate you, brother. Love. Appreciate you, too. See you at the show, man. See you at the show.